Four and a half billion years ago, the gradually unfolding story of our planet Earth began. Great forces in conflict would shape and reshape the planet's surface. And after billions of years of labor, the Earth would be transformed into the world we know today. Steam from the cooling crust formed an enormous dark canopy of clouds. And for century upon century, the contours of the Earth were shaped by endless rain. In the erosive flow of time, the Earth's image is in constant change as sea levels fluctuate and continents take new form. Ours is an evolving Earth, and its history, always in a state of becoming, reveals ever new mysteries. A mystery left in the wake of the great ice ages. Strange cavities in the sea floor, called blue holes, subjects of superstition, they're said to be bottomless, the home of deep sea monsters, and will ensnare any boat that ventures near. Now, Calypso and its divers will challenge superstition. It is late spring when we arrive near Lighthouse Island in the Caribbean. The flag on our bridge honors British Honduras. Within its territorial waters is one of the longest coral reefs in the world. It makes me wonder. To reach one of nature's strangest geological phenomena, located almost in its center, I must find a way to take Calypso seven miles across this hazardous stable reef. We would need the whole arsenal of Calypso's diving gear to probe the mystery of this deep blue cavern in the floor of the sea. Dr. Robert Dill, aboard the Calypso, discusses with Captain Cousteau the scientific need to explore the mysterious blue hole in Lighthouse Reef. This blue hole is, uh, uh, Dill, a marine geologist, feels the exploration may make a substantial contribution to our knowledge of Earth history. I think this is probably our best area to study the changes of sea level that took place when water was taken from the ocean and piled up on the continents during the last ice age. And of course the water as it came out of the ocean uh, it didn't come out all easily, I mean, come out as a straight line, it came out as a series of steps, and we should find evidence of those steps down inside the blue hole. So it may reveal things about the history of the oceans? Yes, and not only the oceans, but also the continents as well, because the water, in order to be lowered from the oceans, had to go up into ice to form the great ice sheets during the last glacial period. Divers are sent out to reconnoiter the shallow reef in the hope of finding a possible passage for Calypso. They find the reef often barely submerged. Clusters of coral, staghorns and elk horns stretch ominously to the surface. To find a safe channel for a vessel the size of Calypso will be a difficult task. Albert Falco directs the placement of plastic marker buoys, yellow for the left side of the channel, red for the right. The men pick a winding corridor through the reef and report back its varying depths to the ship. 
Allo, Calypso, Calypso le Zodiac, attention, top Oui, 29, à bord. Distance 1,52, dans le 18,5. Deck officers Pima Don and Laval prepare a navigational chart of the channel Calypso will follow. Using the ship's radar, they accurately mark the location of each of the buoys. Marking of the seven mile passage will take two full days. Before finishing, Falco's team will drop 32 buoys. The channel's been charted, and with Jean-Paul Bassaget, Calypso's skipper, Cousteau discusses the proposed route. He is concerned that all possible dangers to Calypso have been anticipated and minimized. Vous avez prévu des amarrages solides au trouble? Oui, on a sept amarres. Ce qu'on a prévu, c'est several hazardous obstructions are indicated along the way. Only with the greatest difficulty will they be able to maneuver among the coral heads at these points. But Gusteau decides they will chance it. Two small boats sprint ahead of Calypso to warn of undetected mid-channel obstructions. Cautiously, Calypso advances in the shallow water. From the observation chamber, the beginning of the trip looks encouraging. Two miles into the channel, as the first of the massive coral patches looms ahead, the water beneath us suddenly becomes increasingly shallow. Seven feet under the keel, then suddenly five. Our echo sounder reads less than four feet of clearance as we pass over. Passager receives a signal from the small boats that there are even higher hurdles to cross. The observation chamber is now too dangerous to occupy. A television camera is installed. In case of sudden storm or other emergency, we have lighted buoys at critical turning points in the channel. Dark patches of coral are plainly visible. I grow increasingly worried. The channel is narrowing and becoming even more shallow. Our TV camera below transmits a disturbing scene. André Laban concludes that we now have less than two feet of water under our keel. A 
Ahead of us is one of the most difficult parts of the channel to maneuver. A yellow buoy marks the spot where we must execute a double turn to avoid a massive coral formation. <laughs> I tell the bridge that we may be turning too wide. The water beneath us is getting more shallow. The thing we feared most has happened. Fortunately, instead of wrecking Calypso's wooden hull on the sharp call, we have come to rest on a sandy shore. A diver goes down to inspect for damage. All he finds is a little scraped paint. The task of backing the vessel off the shoal has begun. From a winch, a cable with an emergency anchor is run out behind the ship. Meanwhile, the launches return to take a position at the side of Calypso. Their job will be to gently rock the ship's hull toward the slope of the sandy reef. The combined effort of the thrusting outboards above, the pull on the anchor astern, and the thrust from Calypso's reversed propellers does the job. Passager signals the engine room. They're on the way again. Calypso is now between buoys six and five. They are very close to their destination. Cousteau estimates that they will reach the hole in 20 minutes. At last, a change in the color of the sea surface ahead indicates that the hazardous seven-mile journey across the reef is nearly behind. Now, before us, betrayed by its indigo blue in an otherwise azure sea, is the magnificent blue hole itself. As we pass by its coral and crusted rim, we find the pit dark and mysterious. To the eye, there is no bottom. Tales of sea monsters and doomed ships are soon forgotten in the exhilaration of having reached our goal. We have asked our beloved Calypso to do what no ship has done before, and she has obliged us. Now we would explore this beautiful basin and try to comprehend its depth. A thousand feet wide in diameter, the hole is encircled by a coral flange that would make it difficult to escape in the event of a storm. Beauty and the beguiling invitation of the unknown have lured us. We hope they will not also entrap us. Calypso is moored near the edge of the Blue Hole in Lighthouse Reef. Positioned here, the ship can give direct overhead support to the divers, now preparing to descend. And then we'll go over and 
we'll take a sample. Geologist Bob Dill will accompany the Calypso team below. None of the divers know what they may find as the first full-scale exploration into one of nature's great phenomena gets underway. Just beneath the hole's coral-encrusted rim, the divers encounter a school of disinterested sharks. Continuing down, our divers probe along the face of the cliff. They find it pockmarked with numerous small caves. A giant sea worm is startled by our light. Calcium carbonate debris constantly breaks away from the lip of the pit and falls past our divers. We begin to understand that this hole was once a vast cave, the ceiling of which has collapsed. At 120 feet, our lights catch a strange configuration under a ledge. Our divers move in to investigate. Unfolding before them is an awesome sight. They have discovered a natural undersea cathedral, a massive assemblage of archways with long suspended columns and shadowy alcoves. Bob Dill can barely contain his excitement, for he is seeing what no scientist has observed before. These formations are stalactites, but they are under the sea. It is conclusive proof that this former cave was once above sea level, since stalactites can form only in air. At the end of the ice ages, the rising seas had covered the once dry cave, and its ceiling collapsed to create the British Honduras Blue Hole. The divers make an important observation. Some of the stalactites are vertical, while others are tilted. We are anxious to find out why. The Calypso's two mini-subs are sent down to explore depths beyond the diver's capabilities. In the first, Andre Le Bon. Albert Falco pilots the second. At 155 feet, Falco spots a strange ledge along the side of the hole. He maneuvers his mini-sub as close as possible to this strange formation. Then alerts the Calypso, Calypso, Calypso. and continues his descent. The ledge observed by Falco is now inspected by Bob Dill, too. It is an important find. It is evidence of a former sea level, even lower than the stalactite area they discovered above. A persistent remora distracts the geologist. These so-called sucker fish usually attach themselves to sharks, and Dill almost wishes a shark would come by. Fifty feet above, the divers measure the stalactites. 
and the perplexing 15 degree tilt to some of the formations. Bob and I are led to wonder if some great cataclysm might have upset this region at one time. For our men discover not only tilted formations, but a stalactite broken off and fallen to the shelf below. Far above, diver Raymond Cole finds the point of origin of the broken stalactite, a scar on the cavern ceiling. Meanwhile, Laban is filming Falco as our two mini-subs descend to the bottom. At 412 feet, they are at the bottom. They are cautious so as not to disturb centuries of dust and debris. Moving across the lunar-like plane of calcium carbonate, Falco is confronted by an overhang. Here he finds evidence of small stalactites, indicating a sea level even lower than we found before. Falco and Laban now retreat from the bottom of the sunken cave. They have found no visible life here, not even a monster. Now Calypso's winch and cables labor under the strain of a three-quarter ton prize. With the greatest of care, the broken stalactite is recovered from the shelf on which it was found below. It will be subject to scientific study by Dill and his geological associates in the United States. Still another recovered stalactite will be donated by Cousteau to the British Honduras Museum. Cousteau and Bob Dill hope that inside this specimen may be found the answers to when the oceans rose and fell, and when great upheavals in the earth reshaped this region. After Cousteau delivers the stalactite to a lab for dating and study, Calypso will move to the Bahamas, 800 miles away, where even more unusual caves wait for only the most intrepid of divers to reveal their story. We have a maximum diameter here of uh, one foot five inches about. It's a little regular, but I think that's about close enough. Let's see, that would be uh, 41 uh, centimeters. Don't you taste it normally? <laughs> it's not to see how it tastes, it's to see the size of the sediment. Yes, it's still the size. <laughs> At the University of Miami's marine lab, Dr. Robert Ginsberg has cut the recovered stalactite both vertically and horizontally. The exciting thing we found are these flat top layers of mud. Take a look. Uh, they contain uh, marine fossils, all right. That's right, and they accumulated after the cave was flooded with seawater. And they were horizontal, like spirit levels at the time of accumulation. But now, notice that they have an angle of about 15 degrees with the long axis of the stalactite. So the stalactite must have been tilted about 15 degrees before sea level flooded the cave and these layers were deposited. Uh, we also found the vertical stalactites as well. And we know that stalactites stopped forming approximately 12,000 years ago when sea level came back up. So we here have a, evidence of tipping and then a period of stability. Uh, could you say that uh, uh, 
this uh, tilt of the reef can be correlated to uh, movements of the Earth's crust? Yes, we're, we're just north of the Cayman Trench, and this is a major break between South and North America. And it looks like uh, we've had movement along the trench uh, the, uh, between the two continents, then a period of stability for at least the last uh, 12,000 years. So our little piece of thought may be the key to better understanding the drift of the continents in this area. Yes, I think so. Off Andros Island in the Bahamas, there are more than 100 small openings in the ocean floor. From the air, they look like blue footprints on the reef. Their chain pattern is quite different from the single large cavern in British Honduras. And Cousteau wonders if these caves are connected. To find out, a diving party is off to conduct an experiment. The party is led by Albert Falco in the Calypso's new amphibuggy. Their destination, an inland blue hole. As they approach the shore, they are confronted by suddenly turbulent waters, immediate evidence of a blue hole. It is alive with treacherous currents, siphons, and backwash. Divers can descend into these pits only at slack tide. But the hole Falco's team seeks now is one on shore. The divers follow the equipment-laden amphibian to the inland hole, where the experiment will begin. Seen from the air, the hole's deep blue color betrays its depth. To the men, approaching on the sharp limestone rock, it appears a shallow pond. It is slack tide now, as divers Raymond Cole and Louis Prezelin prepare to drop over the rim of the saltwater pit. Entering a corridor, the men descend easily, but they can still feel a slight current working against them. To learn more about the flow of water in this region, Raymond Cole installs a current meter to record the tidal flow over a 24-hour period. Now the experiment. Louis Prezelin releases a package of harmless green fluorescein dye. It is hoped that the current will carry it far through the cave, and if the blue holes are connected, out into the sea. On the surface, Falco awaits the diver's return. He also waits for the ebbing tide, for it is then that the currents may move the color seaward. We were eager to see if our experiment would prove connection between these underwater caves. From the inland hall to the nearest hall offshore is about 700 feet. At this offshore hall, we had stationed a launch. It would enable us to detect, as soon as possible, any sign of emerging green dye that would prove the underground connection of the Bahama Blue Holes. After 20 minutes, our efforts are rewarded. Our experiment has established that the holes are interconnected. Soon the entire sea around us is awash with dye. We would repeat the experiment all across the reef to find out how extensive was this submerged tunnel system. And we would correlate our findings with the results of our current meter tests. We have about three times the amount of water coming out that went in. How can you explain that? Uh, it must mean that the uh, tunnel network is uh, much more complex than in the areas where we meet our dives. Well, probably the entire Bahamas are a giant sponge. Exactly. We also noticed that the water going into the tunnels from the sea was not very clear. It was uh, That's true. loaded with uh, plankton and animal debris. And yet when it came out, it was crystal clear. Perhaps this packing of the coral reef 
can explain why many of the ancient reefs we see are loaded with uh, petroleum. Well, we might be witnessing the initial development of a new oil field. Maybe. Now, in search for history-revealing stalactites here in the Bahamas, Calypso divers follow the underwater joint pattern that runs from one cave to another. And behold an extraordinary sight. These are common red snappers, but they are swimming upside down. The fish instinctively turn their backs to the light. Since in the cave light is reflected on the sandy bottom, the fish face the cave ceiling instead of its floor. In spite of our artificial light, this confused angelfish continues to do the same. In their upside-down world beneath the ceiling, the fish are completely at home. But not so the divers. There is great danger when one dives in caves. In the sea, a ceiling of any kind may become a trap. Our divers enter a confining corridor resembling a catacomb. Tunnels intersect other tunnels. It's an underwater maze. Finally, our divers can go no further. It's too narrow to get through. They must go back. And still no sign of the stalactites we hope to find. As the divers return, the bubbles of their air tanks, penetrating through the porous limestone ceiling to the floor of the reef above, will graphically mark their way. Even in their departure, the men hope yet to make a discovery comparable to their previous find. But on their way up, through fissures, tunnels, and chimneys, Although they continue to look for proof that this region was once above water, they will not discover a single stalactite. In the Bahamas, Philippe Cousteau encounters Dr. Robert Benjamin, a diver long fascinated by the blue holes. He claims he has a startling discovery to report to Captain Cousteau aboard the Calypso. Now, this, this big stalactite grotto, which we call simply the grotto, we found in September. And in fact, I only saw it in September for a second. We were diving with two of my friends and they are in front of me with a light. I'm with a camera always in the back. And we were at the end of the lifeline. I was holding on, and Tom was going on with the light. And I was just like on a stage, just the first, first seat in a show. Tom was with the light there, and I saw something green. Stalactite, stalactite, in the first moment, you know, it looks like they would be huge, maybe 100 feet high. But we couldn't get, get nearer to it. Uh, this is a tremendous pit. We discovered, in fact, almost by an accident. When we first were gone down, we had, I had no, no feeling of, uh, say, distance or size, and it looked to me like a Carlsbad Caverns. And only later, when we started to explore everything, we really realized the reason. In any case, it is a tremendous cave, one of the greatest that I have ever been in. What Benjamin described, I must see for myself. It will mean one of the most difficult dives we've ever made, deep into the reef. In water too shallow for Calypso, we take the zodiacs a mile and a half to the spot Benjamin has indicated. The strong currents govern our plan. Exactly 10 minutes before the outgoing tide, we start the dive. 
Special high-intensity magnesium torches will help light our way. They will also enable my son Philippe, our cameraman, to film the inner recesses of the cave. For this exceptionally long dive, we carry extra-large tanks. My experiences in cave diving have left memories of danger, fear, near tragedy. Now, as I begin this dive, my curiosity is mixed with strong apprehension. We creep into the narrow opening that leads into the castle. It is like being swallowed by a giant gaping clam. Everything has to work. Our equipment, our muscles, our hearts, our brains. With no open water above our heads, we are sentenced to success. According to Benjamin, we must first head for a chimney-like shaft, down which we must descend vertically to a depth of 165 feet. Down into the realm of nitrogen narcosis, the rupture of the deep which befuddles the mind. I grasp the line left behind by Benjamin. My head is buzzing and my ears ache, but I cannot slow down. As I sink further into the abyss, some words of Emerson run through my mind. Under each deep, a lower deep opens. I find reassurance in the bubbles. In this gloomy underworld, they are symbols of life. While we wait at the bottom of the chimney, Francois Dorado goes to light the long tunnel that lies ahead of us. With his torches from another realm above, he recalls Prometheus, who stole fire from heaven and gave it to man. He mixes fire and water to bring the light of knowledge and the warmth of wisdom to a dark, forbidding world, until now undisturbed by thought. I strain to fight the narcosis and try to clear my head. My friends around me are mere shadows in this eternal night. When the passage is lighted, I signal we go. At this depth of 165 feet, we have but eight minutes to swim 800 feet horizontally. The ceiling above us is an ever-present reminder that we are trapped inside the earth. And under us, for most of the time, there is no floor, only black water of untold depths, a dark abyss into which we would sink hopelessly if we lost consciousness. In this oppressive darkness, I feel what fragile creatures we are, and desperately cling to the narrow flickering beams of truth I know to be our lights. In my confused brain, I feel we have entered Inferno, and the gates are about to close in upon us. The 
long swim seems an eternity of effort. It is a race to beat the outgoing tide. Suddenly, the walls have moved apart, and I know the term of our exhausting journey is near. As I pause to light my torches, my heart is beating heavily, and I am breathing too fast. I try to control it. If I exhaust my air supply, I will be unable to swim back to the world above. Now before us, the grotto. From the ceiling, hundreds of stalactites, witness to eons of darkness, hang. And from below, stalagmites reach up in an effort to join them. We are bedazzled by the sight, and haunted by the sound of strange echoes as the rumble of our torches fills the cave. Formed by dripping water centuries ago, when sea level was lower and the cave was dry, the stalactites now tell their story. None of them here are tilted. Without any doubt, this area has been stable even before the great glaciers melted and the oceans rose to fill and cover this cave 12,000 years ago. We disperse in confusion. Our flares soon cloud the water with liquid smoke and we lose a clear sense of where we are and what we are doing. We are in a trance, a dream, hypnotized, bewitched by the magic of the cave. Sediment, disturbed from the bottom, begins to drift upward, blurring our vision. Suddenly, the spell is broken. I become anxious. We must be able now to find our way back, and no one must be left behind. Near the exit, my flares burn out, and I am caught in darkness. Nervously, I search for the nylon guideline, the thread of life that will lead us out of this labyrinth. At last, I find a line, and we gather to make our departure. takes back a rare specimen for laboratory analysis, a Gorgonian, which in this dark tunnel obtains its solar energy by feeding on plankton brought in by the currents. They are just on schedule, and the 800-foot horizontal journey back is made easier by an outgoing tide.
Ahead of us is the winding shaft that will take us 165 feet up to the surface. To avoid decompression accidents, our ascent is slow. Time for tedious decompression stops will total about an hour. We divers have an expression. You pay for your trip on your way out. Glimmer from above, like dawn, heralds the end of our phantasmic journey. Although we will carry with us forever the visions wondrous strange pilfered from an alien realm, it is with relief that we enter once more the world of men. We are all back and safe, tired but exhilarated. Benjamin's cave was everything he described, and we have had one of our most challenging ventures. We have dived to the very limit of reasonable risk. Why? I could answer, we were trained, prepared and experienced, and we wanted to learn about the sunken caves. But also, man's curiosity is irresistible, and it is its own justification. In the future, our equipment will be perfected. New diving techniques devised, that will help us delve even deeper into our Earth's past. The planet Earth is our home. We need to become familiar with this estate we have inherited and explore it from attic to basement. As the explorer pursues his curiosity, science follows, ever closer to the central mysteries of our Earth.